Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about some of the stuff from Chapter 8 in your astronomy uh, text not book, talking about the Earth and about what makes the Earth so special and uh, why it is that life is able to exist here as opposed to other places where, as far as we know, life doesn't. Um, I had a few really good questions pop in, and hopefully we're going to get to those uh, through the course of this. Um, if I pass by something and you're like, oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute, what about X, Y, Z? You know, just feel free to shout it out in the chat, and I'll try and address it. So we're going to start off with the first chapter. It was called The Global Perspective. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, Hey, can we come back when we finish the board game? Yeah, we can. You can work on that while you're away, too. That's fine. Uh, I thought it was interesting. One of the questions I got was, uh, why is it that educated people don't have a global perspective? Now, I'm not sure if that question was talking about like politics or just about considering the Earth as a globe in and of itself. Uh, the chapter uh, pointed out that it wasn't until we had like Apollo astronauts on the way to the moon that they got really good pictures like the one you see up at the top right here of the Earth as a single globular entity. I mean, we knew the Earth was round. That, that's not what this is about. But until you get a perspective, it's really hard to think about, you know, all of this as being one thing. This picture, I think they called it the blue marble picture. <coughs> uh, and so when we consider the Earth, we're going to take a look at certain things. We're going to take a look at some physical phenomena. We're going to take a look and talk about some of the processes that, as far as we know, led to the Earth existing as it is. We're going to kind of dip our toes into life on the planet and maybe how it got here, uh, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. So a few things about the Earth. Just chemically speaking, um, the Earth is one of the inner four terrestrial planets, and so um, it's made primarily of rock, okay? And that rock is made mostly of heavier elements, quote unquote, like iron, silicon and oxygen, or compounds of iron, silicon, and oxygen. Uh, we refer to these as heavy elements, and we refer to the planet Earth as being a heavy planet because as opposed to a star or a gas giant who are mostly made of things like hydrogen or helium or uh, lighter elements, we do have an abundance of heavier elements here on the planet itself. Uh, another few interesting things about the Earth. All orbits of planets tend to be elliptical. Um, the Earth's is still elliptical, but it's just barely elliptical. It's really pretty close to round. And the fact that it's really close to almost a perfectly circular orbit uh, tends to lend some climate stability to the planet. Uh, and it's one of many things that does that. Um, we're also what's referred in what's referred to as the Goldilocks zone of distance from our star. We're close enough to where it's warm and water can be a liquid, but we're not so close that we've got a runaway greenhouse effect like you see on Venus. And so we're not too hot, we're not too cold, just like in the story of Goldilocks. We're in that place where everything's just right for liquid water to be a thing. And as we're gonna talk about, and as you're gonna see some more this week, liquid water is super important when it comes to being able to sustain life. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's on the inside of the Earth. Now, to be fair, no one has been inside the Earth, okay? I don't care what the movies tell you. I don't care what sci-fi books tell you. You know, Journey to the Center of the Earth is not a thing that's actually happened. Uh, in fact, we have, as far as I know, not even gone down through the Earth's crust. Okay, because by comparison to us, this is a big dang ball of rock that we're sitting on. 
Uh, so anything we know about what's happening inside the Earth and the layers inside the Earth, it's not because anyone's been there or because we've sent robots or probes down there. We know it because of seismic waves. When there's earthquakes, those waves travel back and forth inside of the planet, sort of bouncing around. And if you remember from physics, the medium that a wave travels through, whether it's solid or liquid or gas, influences how it travels, how quickly and how efficiently it travels. And so by studying these echoes of these earthquakes, these seismic waves, we've been able to get a pretty good picture of what the inside layers of the Earth look like. Okay, But again, understand there's no eyewitnesses. Nobody has been down there to actually see what's there. Um, we do know that the Earth is made chiefly of uh, heavier metals like iron, nickel, as well as silicon compounds. So taking it layer by layer, up at the top where we are, we've got the crust. Uh, the crust is only three-tenths of one percent of the Earth's entire mass. Um, and there's two different kinds of crust. Oceanic crust tends to be thinner. Uh, it can be usually about six kilometers deep, so you know three miles or so deep. Uh, it's mostly made of a volcanic rock called basalt. And then you've got continental crust, which tends to be, well, I didn't say go. Go back. Uh, we've got continental crust, which <coughs> is thicker. It can be around 20 to 70 kilometers thick. Uh, now, because it's called continental, it doesn't mean it's just the continents. There is some continental crust that is under the oceans. Uh, but it's made of another volcanic rock called granite, primarily. Um, and then, again, that's just this little skin on the outside. Underneath that, you've got the biggest layer, which is called the mantle. Um, and it goes from where the crust ends down to about 2,900 kilometers. So that is somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 miles deep. So we're talking really, really deep. Um, <coughs> you can subdivide the mantle out into other layers, uh, the lithosphere, lithos means rock, uh, and so that would be the more solid parts of the mantle. Underneath that, you've got more of a goopy, kind of plasticky, uh, not quite solid, not quite liquid part called the asthenosphere. Um, and it's this asthenosphere that is in constant motion, and we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Um, there's not a clear boundary between the two, uh, but you've got some solid chunks sort of floating around on some not-so-solid chunks underneath. Underneath the mantle, we come to the core. The core, if you go from the center of the Earth out to its radius, uh, well, it's got a diameter of about 7,000 kilometers, so uh, there's about 3,500 more kilometers from here down to the center of the core. Um, as far as we're able to tell, again, from seismic waves, and also from other elements that are abundant up here at the crust. Uh, the core is made mostly of iron. There is a good bit of nickel down there, as far as we know, as well as some sulfur, which I know is not a metal. But uh, it's there in substantial amounts. We know this because when some of this material starts leaking up uh, through the crust and we have volcanic activity, there's quite a bit of sulfur and sulfur compounds that come up with it. Um, the outer core is liquid because of the way that the waves uh, move through it. The inner core is much more dense and it's solid. Now these two cores uh, are in motion. Uh, Gage, I think you had a question and some of the other folks had a question about, uh, well, how do we know that it's in motion and what does that have to do with the magnetic field? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, to a degree, we are making assumptions about it being in motion because there is a magnetic field. And, and we'll, when I talk about the magnetosphere here in a few minutes, you'll kind of see what I mean. Um, but if it fits the theory, and if it fits the observations we have, the uh, material inside the inner core is really, really hot. And anytime you get uh, particles that are in motion that are really, really hot, uh, electrons are going to get stripped away and it's going to become electrically charged. 
And so if you'll picture, you've got this electrically charged liquid metal that is moving around this other metal that is solid. And so you've got metal moving past metal. And so anytime you've got electric flow, electric current going on near metal, it generates a magnetic field. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that you get when you have an electromagnet. Uh, it's very similar to what you get when you've got a generator. With a generator, it's just the opposite. You've got a magnet that's spinning inside of a coil of wire, and that causes electricity to flow through the wire. Well, other way around. If you run electricity through a coil of wire, then it can actually magnetize whatever's on the inside of that. And based on the fact that we have a magnetic field that we have measured with spacecraft going up into the atmosphere, uh, that's our best explanation for why that is. So talking more about the magnetic field, the magnetosphere, um, uh, it's not symmetrical. And this is something that came up on the last checkpoint we took. Uh, the magnetosphere uh, is shorter on the side that is facing toward the sun, and it's much longer on the side facing away. But this is a magnetic field that, as far as we know, is generated by uh, liquid metal flowing around the solid metal inside the core. And on the side extending toward the sun, uh, it's about five Earths wide. Okay, at its widest point, or about 60,000 kilometers. Uh, on the other end, which is not in the picture right here, it can actually extend out, let me just see, doing the math in my head, uh, more than six times that. So we're talking like, you know, more than 30 Earths away on the not sunward side as the solar wind sort of blows it out into a long tail. And that tail can actually extend out uh, past where the moon is orbiting the Earth, which you know we've already discussed is pretty impressively far away. Uh, this magnetosphere is extremely important for life to exist on the planet because as these charged particles are coming in from the sun, we talked about the sun some uh, last couple weeks, uh, the magnetic fields here help to trap those particles, those high energy charged particles, those ions coming in and direct them more toward the polar regions. Okay, so we get those aurora up at the north and down at the south. More importantly though, it keeps all of that high energy radiation from the sun from smacking into the bulk of the surface of the earth. And so, you know, right now I go outside and I spend too much time outside, I can get skin damage, I can eventually get cancer. And that's with all of this magnetic protection that we've got. If that magnetic protection was not there, then not only would life basically not be able to exist because the surface would be very harsh, um, a lot of that solar wind would strip our atmosphere completely and totally away. Okay, These magnetic fields here help to prevent that from happening. We didn't realize that these were even here until we started sending spacecraft up into uh, the magnetosphere and they started registering, hey, there's a lot of magnetic fields and there's a lot of radiation up here. And so it's only been maybe 50, 60 years or so that we've even known about the magnetosphere. Uh, it's just been, you know, since the uh, advent of the space program that we even knew any of this was there, you know, helping keep us alive. So it's still, you know, relatively recent information. And that takes us through the first section. Are there any questions that you have? If you do, type them up in the chat. Uh, if not, we're going to move on to the next part talking some more about Earth's crust, which is important because that's where we spend the bulk of our time. A lot of this, if you had a halfway decent uh, eighth grade science teacher, then you should have covered most of this stuff back in eighth grade science. I realize for some of you it's been a little while since then. So uh, big things to kind of jog your memory, try and think back to when you learned about the rock cycle and when you learned about plate tectonics, because we're going to touch on those again. Uh, most of the crust of the Earth is made of volcanic rock, mostly basalt and granite, which were the two that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, now, you find volcanic rock on any of the rocky planets and on any of the rocky moons. Okay, volcanic rock is not that uncommon. What is uncommon are the other two types that we have here on the Earth's crust, sedimentary rock and metamorphic rock. You don't see those as often in other places. And the reason for that has to do with how those rock types are formed. 
uh, if you recall from eighth grade, sedimentary rock is formed when water or wind or ice, in the case of glaciers, uh, grinds up existing rock into smaller pieces or sediment, and then it erodes it, it carries it away, and then it drops it off, it deposits it, so you've got weathering, erosion, deposition, and then you've got cementation, when something is going to come in and chemically bond all of that sediment in those different layers together. And so you're going to end up with some sedimentary rock uh, where you've got wind and where you've got water. Um, other planets don't have water, and many of them don't have wind, and so they don't get sediment. They don't get cementation. Uh, some examples of sedimentary rock that you're familiar with are sandstone, uh, shale, limestone. Metamorphic rock is made when you've got a plant that has active geology, when it's got plate tectonics going on, because what happens is that, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, um, some of the Earth's crust, as the plates are moving against each other, ends up pushing underneath other parts, and when it pushes underneath, it gets put under tremendous pressure, it gets put under tremendous heat, and a lot of times that rock, whether it's igneous from volcanic rock or whether it's sedimentary, um, it gets changed, it gets compressed, it gets warped, folded, chemically it gets changed, and so it ends up changing. Metamorphosis means change into some of these metamorphic rock types. A couple of them are things like slate, marble. Again, that doesn't happen, that's not as common on other planets or on other moons that don't have active geology going on. Now, interestingly enough, and I don't know that I knew this, uh, not in so many words, uh, there's a fourth type of rock, and the reason we don't talk about that in eighth grade is because, for the most part, uh, it doesn't show up on the Earth. And that's what's called primitive rock. Uh, primitive rock is rock that has not gone through volcanism. It has not uh, gone through erosion or sedimentation or metamorphosis. This is rock that, as far as we know, has existed in the same form since the solar system came into being, since uh, you know particles coalesced around a gravity center, which was our sun, and the ones that didn't come together to become planets and then start getting hot uh, are still floating around in orbit around the solar system. We find a lot of those in comets and in asteroids and meteors and some of the smaller moons. Uh, one of the only ways that we know that they exist is sometimes some of those chunks uh, end up falling to Earth and survive re-entry through the atmosphere, and so we've got little meteorites. And those little meteorites, uh, especially some of the uh, rocky ones, not so much the metallic ones, but the rocky ones, that's rock that for the most part has not changed in the billions of years or so, however long it's been since it was first formed. And so when we do have a chance to find some of that rock, we can learn a lot about the origins of our solar system and the origins of even our own planet. Plate tectonics, this is big. Um, talked about this back in eighth grade, I think. Uh, so the Earth's crust is not a solid surface. It's actually made of a number of big what we call plates. Now some of those are continental crusts, some of those are oceanic crusts, but what happens is that these plates are all in motion because heat from the Earth's core is heating up the mantle and it's causing convection currents and as convection currents move the mantle around it causes the crust that's on top of the mantle to slide around with it. And so over time these plates change positions. Uh, they run into each other, they slide past each other, they move away from each other, and anywhere you've got a boundary between plates, you've got some kind of important geological activity going on. Um, in some cases, those plates move together, and that's what's called convergence. When they converge, sometimes they will sort of buckle and push each other up, and that's how mountains get formed. Uh, Brazil, I think you had a question about what's the difference between mountain formation and uh, crater formation. Well, mountain formation is usually caused either by volcanoes 
which happen around plate boundaries, or it's caused by uplift when those plates push against each other and force each other up. Um, sometimes when they move together like that, they don't push each other up, but one will actually slide underneath the other one, and that's what's called subduction. When a plate is subducted, it gets melted back down, and when it gets melted back down, that hot rock starts bubbling up through cracks in the crust over it, and you get volcanoes. Or you get, you know, uh, in the case of a lot of islands, like the Hawaiian Islands or the Aleutian Islands or the Japanese Islands, those are all caused at plate boundaries by volcanic material bubbling up through the crust and actually forming over time these big volcanic mountains which peak up out of the ocean and we've got islands. Uh, you can also have two plates moving away from each other and that's what's called divergence. Uh, if divergence happens between two continental plates, then you actually end up with these big massive things called rift valleys. And it's almost like a canyon, but it's not caused by water eroding rock away. It's actually caused by these plates moving away from each other. Uh, out in the middle of the ocean, when this happens, you have a phenomenon called seafloor spreading, where rock at the bottom of the ocean actually pushes away from other rock, and that helps to drive some of the other plates pushing into each other at the other side. Uh, sometimes you also have what's called a transform plate boundary, and that's when you have plates that are sliding past each other. When they slide past each other, they grind, and when they grind, you get earthquakes. Um, probably the most famous one of these that we know about anyway, as far as a transform boundary, is the San Andreas Fault, which is in California. Um, it kind of slides and then it builds up pressure and then it slides and slips again, then it builds up pressure, then it slides and slips again. When there's a big slip, there's big earthquakes. The last one happened somewhere around 150 to 200 years ago. And so California is well overdue for another great big, huge earthquake. And it being 2020, you know, they've still got a couple months. There's a good chance it could happen. You know, if, if Yellowstone doesn't explode first, you know, which also entirely possible. Um, I've got a link here, and this link takes us to a page. Let me see if I've got it. I think I actually have it pulled up in a different tab here. Uh, this is cool because this describes a area called the Ring of Fire. And the Ring of Fire is actually uh, located around the Pacific Ocean. And that's because the Pacific Plate actually rubs against a number of other plates all the way around it. And so you've got volcanic activity happening all around this. Um, now, on this map right here, this is from the USGS, or United States Geological Survey. They're only interested in, or they're only showing here volcanic activity in the continental US. And, you know, a little bit out here in Hawaii. Let me zoom in on Hawaii. You can see we've got three active, uh, or four active volcanoes here on the Big Island. Uh, you've got another O active one here on Maui. Okay, but all of these Hawaiian islands were formed by volcanic activity and are still being formed. Um, up here in Alaska, the Aleutians, which is the long little chin beard that Alaska has going off toward Russia, a huge string of volcanoes um, that stretch all the way through there. And so all of those islands are, you know, or all of that is caused by active volcanism and it's caused by this uh, trench here. Um, it doesn't show on this, but there's, there's volcanic activity happening. Now there's a few over here because we're in the uh, Mariana Islands and some of those are still under US, US jurisdiction. I think American Samoa is down here somewhere. Oh yeah, there it is. And so we've got some stations set up to monitor some volcanoes there in American Samoa. But you've got volcanic activity happening all around this area. Now, sometimes that volcanic activity causes volcanoes. Uh, sometimes slippage of those cause earthquakes underwater. And so this is where a lot of tsunami activity happens. And so like in Japan, 
you know, they got hit by that big tsunami a few years back. It was because of plate movement out here. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can get back to my main presentation. There it is. Okay. Um, so here's a few more things. This right here at the bottom right, this is a picture of the San Andreas Fault. You can kind of see from the air. I mean, it's it's a pretty impressively straight line, and you can tell you know where those two plates are butted up right next to each other. Um, here's a diagram showing. <coughs> What's happening? This is happening at a divergent zone. Whoops. Dang it. Go back. Happening at a divergent zone, you've got a plate moving to your left and a plate moving to your right. And so where they are moving out, the seafloor is spreading and you're getting some upflow of magma to make new rock. Uh, this right here is a convergent zone where this plate is being pushed underneath. The plate right here is they're moving together. And so you can see as it pushes underneath, it heats up, and that hot rock that's melted back down escapes up through volcanic vents, and we get volcanoes. All right. Any questions on 8.2? And I'm talking a lot. I'm already 26 minutes in. i got to pick up the speed here a little bit. Okay, Earth's atmosphere. Um, this is a really good picture showing the different layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the troposphere is down here. This is where, if we're going to actually get off of our planet, this is going to be where we spend the bulk of our time. Um, that's the first uh, 10 kilometers. This is where you've got moisture. This is where you've got wind. You've got clouds. You've got convection. You've got weather. Uh, up above the clouds, you've got an area called the stratosphere. Uh, it's very cold, very dry. You don't have clouds up there. Um, the atmosphere is getting less and less dense, and so it becomes more difficult to breathe. Up at the top of that, you've got a layer called the ozone layer. Ozone is a molecule which is made of three atoms of oxygen bonded together. Um, I did have a question from a student, I don't think she's here, asking about why the ozone is so good at absorbing ultraviolet radiation. I've actually got a link to a page where some nerd talks about that, uh, and I'm going to put this up later in Classroom for you to get in and click these links and have a copy for yourself. But if you're interested in that, you can click that. The important thing to note is that the ozone layer uh, helps to uh, maintain the greenhouse effect, which helps to keep the uh, surface of the planet warm enough to sustain life. If the ozone layer wasn't there, then uh, you know it would get very, very cold here. Uh, above that, you've got a layer called the mesosphere. Uh, the chapter really doesn't talk very much about that. Meso just means middle. So, you know, it's just kind of there. In the mesosphere, there's still enough atmosphere for things moving through it to get heated up uh, due to friction. So, like, meteors uh, will fall through the mesosphere and burn really bright. We see them as shooting stars. Uh, spacecraft coming back in, when they're moving through the mesosphere, they get very, very hot uh, on re-entry. And sometimes, if they're not built properly, they'll burn up. Up above that... If you get up past 100 kilometers and out, you enter what's called the ionosphere. The ionosphere is actually very, very hot. Uh, and that has to do with radiation coming in from the sun, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the atoms up there are ionized, which means that they become positive and negatively charged. Um, and then there's a constant leak of atmosphere into space. Now, Lion, I think you had a question about that saying, well, couldn't you just say that the atmosphere technically goes on forever? Yeah, I'm not really sure who arbitrarily decided that these distances are where we would call these different layers. Um, I just know that once you reach the ionosphere, it's thin enough to where spacecraft or satellites or other stuff moving through there, they're not feeling friction. And so they're able to move through fairly freely without burning up. Um, but there are a lot of ions, and so a spacecraft passing through this part, getting into some of those radiation belts up in the magnetosphere. Uh, sometimes a spacecraft that's coming up through those different layers, they'll hit the ionosphere and will lose radio contact with them until they move through it. Because there are so many charged ions moving through there that we lose that contact. Interesting thing, and this is kind of a freebie, somebody had proposed that if we had some way of anchoring cable, like 
copper cable or some kind of other metallic cable here at the surface of the planet and extending it up into the ionosphere, maybe having it stretch out to a satellite that's in geosynchronous orbit, then as that cable moved through the ionosphere, it's going to generate electricity. So if we could set those up, we have electricity forever, just from the metal moving through those charged ions, kind of like a generator. We wouldn't have to worry about wind. We wouldn't have to worry about nuclear, coal. Uh, we just have to, you know, collect the electrons as they float down those cables from space. You know, I don't know what kind of engineering would be involved in making that happen, but that would be pretty cool. Uh, the atmosphere is made, now this is a quote right out of the chapter, so I'm not going to read it to you. Um, our atmosphere, most of you know this if you took chemistry with me, is uh, mostly nitrogen which is chemically inert for the most part. Uh, N2 gas doesn't do very much. Very small, I think about 20% oxygen. If there was more oxygen in our atmosphere, then we would not be able to, uh, well, if there was less, we would have a hard time breathing. Uh, if there was more, then we would all become very highly flammable. And that would, that would be exciting, but it wouldn't be very good for life. Um, now we do know, that the atmosphere has changed over time. And the way that we know this is another question that came up from another uh, student yesterday, uh, is that we can look at rocks and we can date those rocks and do a chemical analysis on them and the composition of different substances in there is very, very similar to what would have been at the atmosphere at the time that they were formed. Um, we can also get to glaciers and we can uh, drill down these big cores and go through several layers of glaciers that have been around for you know, thousands of thousands of years and look at the dissolved gases in those different cores. And we can tell, you know, even from those, that the atmosphere has changed. We, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that early Earth's atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide and methane. Um, which would not have been able to support most of the life we have on the planet now, but certain kinds of life, like uh, archaea bacteria, would have been very at home in that kind of environment. Um, at some point, photosynthetic or chemosynthetic bacteria started churning out oxygen, which then probably was reacted very quickly with some of these other gases uh, to make other compounds, but at some point, enough oxygen built up to where we got a breathable atmosphere. And we're talking, you know, again, no eyewitnesses. If this happened like we expect it happened, it would have taken billions of years. Um, and the chapter also talks about some things that might have uh, contributed to the fact that we have a water cycle. Uh, mainly, it's like, where did this water come from? And some theories say that uh, other, uh, it came from exterior sources like comets, Falling into our atmosphere, comets are mostly water, so we could have got water from there. Some suggest that some of the uh, elements that are down deeper in the Earth's core and the mantle are bubbling up and out, and that reacted in some way in order to give us water. Uh, Mason, I know you had a question regarding life coming from another planet, uh, like Mars or something like that. That's an interesting theory. That's what's called the theory of panspermia, meaning that life originated somewhere besides Earth. I'm not going to delve too much into theories about how life actually got here. Uh, and reasons for that is that's something you hopefully should have covered back in biology. Uh, two, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of different possible viewpoints there, and we really don't have the time to get through it right now. If you want to talk about it sometime, we totally can. Um, weather versus climate. Again, this is something you should have learned back in, I think, eighth grade. Weather is short term. Um, it's caused by a movement of the atmosphere, whether it's on our planet, whether it's somewhere else, uh, caused by convection, and then by something called the Coriolis effect, which is you know the effect that the Earth's rotation has on all of the gas that's in the atmosphere around it. Um, climate is long term. Okay, we don't you know, go outside to check the climate. We go outside to check the weather. The climate is long-term weather patterns. And uh, they are much slower to change. They do change. Uh, best evidence we have of this is uh, 
evidence looking at patterns in erosion and deposition and stuff like that, which would indicate that we had large chunks of ice covering portions of North America and Europe and Asia, uh, actually probably several times throughout the history of Earth. The most recent one, we believe, uh, ended about 14,000 years ago, and that's something called an ice age. Uh, I've got some links on here, and three of them are to YouTube links. I've also got those YouTube videos posted in a uh, playlist over on the class YouTube channel, which you should check out when you get a chance. But this page right here I thought was really interesting. Um, I've got it pulled up here. So this right here is a clickable map of the Earth. Now this right here is what the Earth looked like in 2016, and the white shows the location of glaciers. Okay, so you can see that Greenland is covered mostly with glaciers. There's a little bit in Iceland, some up here in northern Canada and getting toward the Arctic Circle, some down here around the coast of Alaska, some north of Siberia, and then of course we've got some down in Antarctica. Uh, this right here is 19,000 BC. So take a look at the glaciers there. So let me zoom in. Here's the United States. Now us down here in the Panhandle, we wouldn't have known too much of a difference was going on, except maybe it was quite a bit greener then. Uh, but anybody up here, you know, up here, Boston, Toronto, Chicago, Minnesota, and all of Canada, they were underneath very, very thick glacier. There was also glaciation and melted glaciers contributing to much larger lakes over in the western United States. See, here's, you know, that right there, that little chunk is Great Salt Lake today. Look at how much greater it used to be. And uh, over here by Reno, Nevada, there was a very large lake right there. Um, and so, also I want you to take a look, look at these coastlines. Look at what Florida looked like. With all of that water locked up in glaciers, the sea level was decidedly lower. Now, again, this is 21,000 years ago. Okay, as best we are able to tell from fossils, as best we are able to tell from looking at rock formations and stuff around these coasts. But you can really get into the site and you can see uh, differences in the current coastlines, which are outlined in white, and the older coastlines, which are in color. Now, this site goes so far as to kind of project at the rate the glaciers are melting. They say that by 3000 AD, glaciers are going to be decidedly smaller. And if you zoom in and you take a look at some of these coastlines, uh, basically, you know, I wouldn't invest in real estate in Miami anytime soon if I were you, uh, because, you know, in, in another thousand years, it may not be there. Uh, but again, this is just, you know, based on some models. There's no way of knowing for sure, you know, how accurate any of this is. But the important thing to keep in mind there is that the crust does change and the climate does change. Let me see. I'm not sure how many more slides we have to get through here. I'm going to try and get us through because we're almost about to hit our time. I'm going to jump to 8.5. Gosh, I would really like to take some more time and talk about this. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to stop the video here for today. And uh, I will, at the first part of Zoom tomorrow, um, I'll talk about this last little chunk, chunk 8.5, because there's a lot of really cool stuff to talk about there and I don't want to have to rush through any of it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit stop now.